Hello everyone and welcome to Experiment Designs in Computer Science 2021 Week 3 Statistical Inference Part 1 What is a Statistical Inference? I'm Klaus and let's start our class. So, last lecture we talked about something we called st descriptive statistics. We talked about point estimators that we can use to calculate at the estimate of a value that you are interested in. For example, what is the average height of students in a university or in a course? We also talked about interval estimators, which is a way to calculate a range of possible values for a parameter that you are interested in. So what is the range of possible values for the running, running speed of this program? Okay. Now, this is already something very good that you can use to describe systems that you are studying under experiments. But sometimes this is not enough. Sometimes uh, we don't want only to describe a system, we want to make a decision. For example, we may want to say, is this program taking longer than necessary? Um, is this program uh, effective enough, precise enough to satisfy some sort of like task? So the descriptive statistics will not give you that answer. They just say, oh, these are the possible values. So you need to do some, you need something a little bit more. And the statistical inference, which is the tool that we're going to study today, is one of the ways that we can do that. Now, statistical inference is very important for this course. We're going to start about the basics of statistical inference today. And the next two classes, we will also talk about more advanced topics on statistical inferences. So I recommend that you listen to this class carefully and if you have any questions don't hesitate to bring them to the office hours this week so let's start with an example let's say that you are the owner of a factory that produces chocolate you're a very lucky person so uh, in your factory the packages are supposed to contain 300 grams of chocolate so of course the factory is not perfect uh, it's physics it's the real world so sometimes a package has 301 grams sometimes the package has 295 grams but on average you expect your factory to produces to produce uh, packages with 300 grams now of course you want to make sure that if something breaks you know so every six months you do a test you, check, you want to check if everything is working correctly, if your factory is still producing packages in the expected, on the expected values. So how do you do that? Well, you took the class last week, so you think, oh, I can do an experiment. That would be great. So every six months, you do an experiment to see if the average package production in your factory is within the expected value. So you take a sample, let's say 30 packages, and then you wait and you calculate this, the sample mean, okay? After you calculate the sample mean, you got this value, 209.5. So what? Okay, 209.5 is less than 300. So is your factory broken? Well, you know that the sample mean has an error also from last class. So you calculate the 95 confidence interval to see how big is the error. The 95 confidence interval gives you that 280 grams to 370 grams. The question continues, is your factory operating normally? Well, from this information, you cannot really tell. You know that the 95 confidence interval gives you a range of values, and this range has a 95% chance to include uh, the true value. So there's a 95% chance that the true value is somewhere around here. But um, wh where is it? For instance, um, it could be 285. It could be 295. And if it's not in this range, okay, and this is one thing that is important about the 95% confidence interval, if it's not in this range, it could be anywhere. So. Is your factory broken or not? We need more information before we make that decision. So this is why we use statistical inference. The idea of statistical inference is that it's a technique that uses data analysis to establish the probable truth of a statement. Maybe you studied logical inference 
uh, during grad during your undergraduate school. You remember logic inference? If A implies B and A is true, that means that B is true. If A implies B and B implies C, if A is true, then C is true. So here you're using logic operators to show this, the truth of a statement. Statistical inference is similar. You're using statistical data to prove a probable truth of a statement. Okay, so how does it work? First, we create a probabilistic model that will describe our system and the possible outcomes of an experiment. Then we calculate statistics from a sample data and these statistics are described as a random variable and we analyze them. Using this sample data, we compare the characteristics of these statistics with the characteristics of the model and we see if they match. And then we can say, okay, this model really describes the system that I'm trying to study. Or no, this model does not describe the system that I'm trying to study. And maybe the model is the factor is broken or the model is the factor is operating normally. So based, for instance, based on the model, the factor is operating normally. Is the statistic consistent with this model? That's the question that we do with statistical inference. Okay, so the key idea of statistical inference is statistical hypothesis. And you probably heard of statistical inference as hypothesis testing. That's how we say it. Hypothesis testing, we create a hypothesis and uh, we do experiments to see if this hypothesis is true or not. Now, it's important here to note that we're talking about statistical hypothesis that is different from just hypothesis. That is also a word that we use in science and in common language. So when we're saying hypothesis, normal general hypothesis, a hypothesis is a statement that explains a phenomenon that we observed. We have a rock and we don't see any tigers around, so this rock protects you from tigers. That's a hypothesis. That's a pretty stupid hypothesis, but it's a hypothesis. Now, a statistical hypothesis is a statement about a statistical model. So for instance, for instance we want to know if our chocolate factory is working normally, okay? So the statistical hypothesis here is that a population model that describes the weight of a package in our factory has a mean of at least 300 grams. So we can describe this as an equation, mu of white, and mu is usually a letter that means the mean, okay? So mu of white is bigger, is equal or bigger than 300, is greater or equal than 300. Okay, so note that we start with a scientific question, is my factory broken? And from the scientific question, we create a statistical hypothesis. The mean production of the factory is greater or equal than 300 grams. From the same statistic scientific question, we can create several hypotheses and we can do several experiments. Okay, so reviewing. A common hypothesis is a general statement about what we believe about the world. A statistical hypothesis is a statement about parameters in a statistical model. In this class, we are focused on statistical hypothesis. So a common hypothesis would be the factor is broken and producing less cocoa than normal. A statistical hypothesis is the mean weight of packages is less than 300 grams. A common hypothesis would be the proposed algorithm is faster than the standard algorithm. A statistical hypothesis for the same problem would be the difference in the mean execution time between the proposed and the standard algorithm is above two seconds. Look here that we are talking about a model. There's a model that describe the proposed, the, the execution time of the proposed method. There is a model that describe this, this, the, ex, the execution time of the standard algorithm. Both of these models have a mean and the difference between these means is two seconds or more. Okay, so a statistical hypothesis is a hypothesis about a statistical model. Common hypothesis. Cats are more popular than dogs. How do we make a statistical hypothesis out of that? There are many different ways. We can say that, okay, cats are more popular, so that means that they will have more likes on YouTube video. More likes on YouTube video is still not a statistical hypothesis. We have to make a model. So our model is there's if every YouTube video has a proportion of watch, if it was watched 5%, 10%, 100%. So we can measure the proportion of cat videos that were the proportion of cat videos that were watched and the proportion of dog videos that were watched. 
So we have two percentages here, one percentage of proportion of wattage cat videos, one percentage of proportion cat watched dog videos. And we say the proportion of cat videos is on average 5% bigger than proportion of dog videos. Okay, so again, we have a statistical model here. We're comparing two quantities. One easy way to think about it is that a statistical model, a statistical hypothesis can usually be represented as equations. Okay, so we can make many hypotheses from the same question. So what is a good hypothesis? And this is not only statistical hypothesis, it's what is a good hypothesis in general? So if you want to do a hypothesis that you can test with an experiment, there are some characteristics that make a hypothesis good, okay? A scientific hypothesis. So one of them is the predictive power. So a good hypothesis not only explains the existing data, but also helps you pre uh, pre predict future data. Why is that? If the hypothesis only predicts the past, then you test it and maybe you get support for it and that's it. It predicts the past. Uh, it doesn't really serve for anything in the future. Uh, it can be served for some sorts of analysis where you want to compare interpretations of the past. But if you're doing an experiment, then you probably want to see if the, this hypothesis holds in the future. So you want your hypothesis to have predictive power. So let's give an example. A hypothesis will without predictive power. There were mistakes in the factory because the workers were tired yesterday. You can check. You can ask the workers if they were tired or not. You can measure the mistakes compared with other days. You can test how tired the works were yesterday with the, how tired the works were the last week. And then you can test if this hypothesis is true or not. But it doesn't say anything else because the workers were tired yesterday. Um, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. A hypothesis that has a little bit more predictive information would be there were mistakes in the production because the workers are always tired on Mondays. If I show that this is true, if I show that on Mondays the, the, the workers are more tired than usual and there are more mistakes in the factory on Mondays than usual, then I can start to investigate what is it about Mondays that makes the workers tired and can I improve that? Can I change that? So predictive power is important for a hypothesis. Now, there is also uh, the principle of parsimony that is usually called Occam's razor. The idea is that the hypothesis makes as few assumptions about the system as possible. Let's say that we have, we're analyzing the usage of energy and we can say, oh, the pattern of uses of energy in this building can be explained by this neural network with 1 million parameters. So you can run the neural network and see if the neural network predicts the pattern. And if they predicts, great, then you say, okay, this neural network is the model for my pattern. You can also try to explain the same pattern with a third degree polynomial. A third degree polynomial has three parameters. If your third degree polynomial explains the energy in the same quality as the neural network or in approximate quality of the neural network, then your third degree polynomial is better because it's simpler, okay? So if everything is equal, if all the proof, if all the evidence is equal, a, a hypothesis that has fewer, param fewer parameters, a hypothesis that is simpler, that makes less assumptions, is better than a hypothesis that makes more assumptions, that is more complicated, that has more parameters. Okay, then we have external consistency. External consistency is that the hypothesis fits with existing data existing knowledge about the system. So you don't want to invent something completely new if existing information already explains the system. Of course, if you're studying something that is completely new and nothing that exists explained, then of course you need new ideas. But if you have existing ideas that could explain your system, then that would make your hypothesis simpler and better in a scientific sense. So for instance, let's say that we're studying global temperature and we want to see what kind of effects could, um, what kind of factors could affect um, global temperature. And we can say, oh, I have an hypothesis that maybe global temperature is correlated with number of active pirates. And you calculate the amount of piracy in a year and you calculate the global temperature, you can see if there is a correlation or not. There is. Um, the problem is, um, what is the relationship between pirates and temperature? It doesn't make any sense. So that's not a very good hypothesis because you're not, you can't really explain 
what do you learn from this correlation? It's very likely that this correlation is just a coincidence because there is no direct link between pirates and temperature. Unless you think that with higher temperature, the ice melts and there is more water, so there's more space for the pirates. Never mind. On the other hand, there is a lot of research that says how CO2 gas creates a greenhouse effect that traps temperature. So that would give more uh, support to a hypothesis that correlates global temperature with CO2 emissions. So you can make this hypothesis and you can test it. You can collect data to support or reject the hypothesis. And it's a better hypothesis than pirates because if the data support your hypothesis, you can already make a theory about why that happens. Okay. So these are some of the qualities that we want in a hypothesis. There are a few more that we're going to talk about in the future. Okay, so we have a hypothesis. How do we use it in an experiment? The general approach for using hypothesis is we have a phenomenon that we want to study and we have a scientific question that we want to answer. We ge generate multiple hypotheses for this phenomenon. And then we run an experiment that compare this hypothesis and we decide which of them fits the data best. Does hypothesis A fit the data best or does hypothesis B fit the data best? Okay, so the idea is that you have two hypotheses that are different, that they compete, and your data will support one hypothesis or the other. So let's see, the step one, create hypothesis. Hypothesis one, the mean weight of packages produced by my factory is above 300 grams. Hypothesis two, the factory is broken so the packages that are produced have much less weight than 300 grams. Hypothesis three, the packages produced by the factory follow a sine wave. I don't know, could be true. So next we do our experiment. We obtain the data. We collect 10 cocoa packages randomly and then we weight them. And here are the weights, 293, 325, 271, 311, etc., etc. Of course, after we collect the weights, we calculate some statistics. For example, we calculate a sample average, in this case it's 294 grams. And then we calculate the minimum and the maximum. The minimum is 248, 325. Now looking at this data, which hypothesis does this data support? Does this data support hypothesis one best? Does this data support hypothesis two best? Or does this data support hypothesis three best? That's the question we want to answer. Now, in the statistical inference, the process of statistical inference is organize this idea, okay? The idea of the statistical inference is that given the sample data, we calculate the probability that the data appears in each hypothesis. So what is the probability that this data appears in hypothesis one? What is the probability that this data appears in hypothesis two? What is the probability that this data appears in hypothesis three? And we are going to give more credibility to the hypothesis that maximizes this probability. So that's the procedure of statistical inferences. Get two or more hypotheses, get the data, and see what is the probability of this data under each hypothesis. We calculate the conditional probability of the data under each hypothesis. So let's go back to our example. We have this data X and we have all the uh, hypothesis one. Okay, let's focus on the first two hypotheses. Hypothesis one the mean of the population is above 300. And note that this is the mean of the population. Now, the mean of the sample will be different because the mean of the sample always has an error. But the question is, if we assume that the mean of the sample is 300 or more, what is the probability that we see this sample? Sorry, if we assume that the mean of the population is 300 or more, what is the probability that we see the sample? And then we have our hypothesis two. Our hypothesis two is the mean of the population, mu, is 300 or less than. And to make it more clear, we add a delta. So it's 300 minus delta. So this delta is how much we are worried. If it's like one gram less, we don't care. But maybe if it's 10 gram less, we care. So we define a delta. What is the difference that we care? So the hypothesis two is that the mean of the population is less than 300 minus this delta. Now, which of these two hypotheses has the biggest probability? Now, we call this 
we, we have one thing that is the new hypothesis significant test. So the, what described before is the new hypothesis significant test. The two hypotheses that we have, we give special names for them. We have the new hypothesis that we call H0, and we have the alternate hypothesis that we call H1. Now, the new hypothesis, H0, indicates the absence of effects. Everything is normal, the factor is nothing broken, everything is as it always has been. It's a conservative model in the sense that nothing special is happening. Everything is as I expected it to be. Nothing changed. So, in, our, in this case, our new hypothesis is, as we expected, the mean weight of the packages is at least 300 grams. Now, in opposition to the new hypothesis, we do the alternate hypothesis, which is 8.1. The alternate hypothesis indicates some effect. We are using a medicine that has some effect on the disease. There is a problem in the factory that is causing an anomaly. Okay, So there is an anomaly in the factory and the mean production is below 300 grams. So that's our alternate hypothesis. So how do we choose the new hypothesis? Okay, The new hypothesis is chosen using existing knowledge. We can use it from the theory. For instance, we have a model that we want to validate if this model is true. We can use from system requirements. So we want to see if a system is compliant. So we use this compliance model as our new hypothesis. Uh, for the factory example, someone we have a, an, a situation where one client complained about our packages on Twitter. They said, oh, this I, I bought a package and I only had 200 grams. So we suspect that maybe there is a problem. Because we suspect that maybe there is a problem, we see how much we advertise, and then we sample 20 packages and we estimate the mean of the population from the sample. In this case, our new hypothesis is the package has the size that was advertised. And the alternate hypothesis is the package does not have the size that was advertised. So this is the general, the basics of the new hypothesis significance testing for statistical inference. In the next video, we're going to explain now how we do we decide between the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. Be warning, be warned, there will be a little bit of mathematics in, uh, involved. So, see you there.